Yeah, make sure my mic's on here. I guess y'all can still hear me nonetheless. Just YouTube may not be to hear me. There we go. Good morning. Y'all Y'all know it's going to be serious when I bring the hard stuff up here on stage instead of water. It's going to be good today. Now, it's, as always, it's good to, to worship with you guys. And I've really been enjoying, whether you have or not, I don't know, but I've been enjoying our, our series through the Sermon on the Mount. And as I said from the beginning, you know, originally 15 weeks, we're now uh, looking at 20 weeks and the possibility of up to 25. The reason being is we don't want to restrict ourselves um, with simply, you know, going by the calendar. We have to, you know, preach this and move on. You know, I really want to take every word that Jesus said in this Sermon on the Mount to a, a deeper level because <clears throat> as many times as we read these, these, this sermon or read the passages of Scripture, we can often as believers say, well, I've heard this story, I've read this account, I've you know, been taught the words of Jesus from a young age. But as adults, instead of dwelling on, well, I've read this, studied this, gone through this, let's say, God, what else is there to learn to, to dig deeper into your word? Because God's word is living and is active and it's able to change lives because it is God's word. So the last thing we want to do is rush through what Jesus says here. So, you know, the last few antitheses of Christ within the Sermon on the Mount, we've been breaking down into two parts. Um, Michael helped me um, a few weeks ago in part two of the command against murder. And Jesus helping us understand that it goes so much deeper than just that technicality following the the letter of the law you know every every t's cross every i dotted and so with jesus teaching with jesus words again we don't want to rush through it but rather take it for what it is it's the the sermon from our savior our lord our creator and so there's always something to glean and understand even if we did this sermon series in you know two years from now there's still be things that I learn and glean from it, and that's the beauty of Scripture. So with the Sermon on the Mount, you know, we started with the overall you know, summary, synopsis of the Sermon on the Mount, then the summary of the Beatitudes, and then getting into week three, finally, verse one of chapter five with the Beatitudes, looking at the characteristics of a believer. You know, the crowds have gathered because Jesus was doing all these miraculous things, these healings, all these things that word was getting out. You know, despite the lack of social media and internet, word was being spread throughout the region about this man, Jesus, who's now doing amazing things. And so now with the crowd, he truly separates the people who want to see cool things the ones who simply want to maybe be healed themselves or bring a family member who has an ailment to be healed from those who truly want to be disciples of Christ. So he sits down on the side of the mountain and teaches his disciples, not just the, the 12, but the, the crowd that was gathering, you know, that continued to grow. And as you can picture, word was getting out about this sermon and more people were coming as he preached and spoke and taught these disciples because what he wanted to say is you know if you truly want to follow me if you you call yourself a disciple say I am rabbi I am your teacher well this is what a follower of mine looks like and so he starts with the beatitudes characteristics he says if you're a disciple of mine this is how you will look this is where your desire should lie it's not a maybe one day you could look like this, but no, if you are truly a follower of mine, there are responsibilities. There, there is a sense of a requirement that we have. It's not simply, you know, checking it off and saying, well, I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus enough. No, I'm a Christian, and because of that, because of all that Christ's done, you know, how do I now live my life? How do I change? What do I look like? Because I am called to be separate from the world. I'm in the world. But we're not to look like the world. So how does that look? So he gives us the Beatitudes and says, this 
at minimum should be a desire of every believer. You know, you say, I don't have, you know, I don't fit the description that Jesus lays out, but I long to look like this. Then that is proof that we are a disciple, a follower of Christ. Then he goes into now a role of, uh, as Christians, as we now call ourselves, as followers of this Jesus. And he says, we are to be salt and light to the world. Not you may be, but you are the salt and light to the world. You are that moral backbone, that ethical guideline. You, as my followers, will look like this and live like this. Then he gets into this description and understanding of the law, the Old Testament law, and saying, I'm not here to abolish, to destroy, to take away, diminish, none of that. Although many pundits and other you know, scholars would say, well, he completely abolished the laws of Moses, where Jesus you know, specifically says, I did not abolish, I did not come. My desire is not to abolish, to change anything except to fulfill the sacrificial, the ceremonial parts of the law that no man could fulfill. He fulfilled with his death and resurrection on the cross. And so in adding that, he gets into the, the six antitheses where Jesus says six times, you have heard it said, but I say. Again, not in contradiction to God's law, but in contradiction to man's twisted you know, misinterpretations of God's law. The scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day, they were, again, concerned with the letter of the law, not the heart of it. Why Jesus gave us this command in the first place and how we live out these commands in our lives each and every day. You know, the very first one Jesus teaches us in verses 21 and 22, that it is not enough to be technically innocent of murder. You know, say the Pharisees say, I haven't taken an innocent life. I am good. But Jesus says you can have murderous thoughts and attitudes without carrying out the physical act, and thus you are guilty in breaking this command. You know, he's flipping the, the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees on its head, calling out their hypocrisy, their so-called righteousness and holiness by saying, well, I've definitely not committed murder, but Jesus says, but you harbor hate, you harbor vengeance in your heart, you harbor a sense of anger that you've allowed to fester, and that is breaking that command, even if you have yet to take a, an innocent life. And then in uh, verses 27 and 28, Jesus says, it is not technically innocent, you're not technically innocent of adultery because it's the lustful thoughts that destroy our purity of mind, our purity of thoughts. We say, I've never physically followed through. Yes, I've dreamed about it. I've thought about it. I've looked at things that I know are not right. But it's, it's innocent because it's just me, just my thoughts. It doesn't hurt anybody else. And I'm never going to actually physically commit adultery. So I'm righteous. I'm holy. I'm okay. Where Jesus says, no, these lustful thoughts, the dwelling on and continue to allow those um, lustful thoughts, those dirty thoughts to fester, to grow. And we say again, I'll never do anything with these thoughts. But Jesus says, whether you do and follow through or not, these lustful thoughts are breaking the command against adultery. He truly you know, elevates the severity of lust within our hearts. And shows us that what we allow in our minds through our eyes affects the way that we think, affects the way that we perceive the world and even look at others. And that's why, you know, porn and certain other things in this world that are so popular, you know, billion dollar industries are dangerous because it alters our sense of sexuality. It alters our sense of purity. You know, from a young age, our kids are you know seen you know being just open to these these visions to these pictures to these videos and they are destroying one's understanding of God's gift of sex within marriage and altering it to something filthy something far removed from God's design so technically we haven't committed adultery but Christ again says but I say to you 
because you've looked at another with lust in your heart, you have broken this command. Again, showing us that these commands go so much deeper than just the letter of the law. Then we saw last week, Jesus in the the third antithesis, he's teaching that divorce of a wife and also divorce of a husband for, you know, a flippant, inadequate reason. Even you say, well, according to the the law of Hillel, you know, we're we're okay. I, I met the requirements. I had the proper paperwork. I handed it to my wife. And yes, it may be a silly reason, but According to man-made law, according to scribes and Pharisees, this is okay. I can rightfully divorce her. I can say that covenant truly didn't mean anything in God's eyes, in my eyes, and therefore I'm moving on because I found somebody else. I allowed the lustful thoughts to fill my mind, not yet commit adultery, but I went through the proper channels. I did everything right. I filed for divorce. Everything's good. I'm still righteous. I'm still holy, but Christ says, but I say to you, that is an illegitimate divorce. That is sinful, and you've caused yourselves to commit adultery in the eyes of God because you've followed man-made laws, man-made traditions, and followed through with divorce and broken this holy covenant created by God. Again, they had all the right things to say. They thought they were going through the right channels, but Christ has shown us that there, this is a serious commitment. This is a serious promise that needs to be taking, taken just as serious and understood as Christ understands marriage and that gift from God. And now following the same pattern with the fourth antithesis, Jesus now is addressing the subject of truth, of oaths and promises. You know, it's this theme of clarifying the laws of God with this significance of oaths and promises made. You know, we have the command to speak the truth. You know, do not lie. You know, maintain integrity in word and in deed. And telling the the truth and being honest with our words is something we should all care about, especially as a follower of Christ. And, And we say, well, of course, we know honesty is, is the best policy. Honesty it will always get you where you need to go. But yet, we, we feel it's okay in certain situations, you know, to have that little white lie. You know, we love to find a loophole to justify ourselves. And it's nothing new. It was a part of Jesus' day, and it's been a part of human nature since creation, is to, to bend the truth, to alter the truth, to best fit you know, our reputation to best fit the outcome that we want. And so while we know the value and significance of honesty from a young age, and you've heard it, you've said it, I know I have, from a, from a young age, we all feel the need to accentuate, to add power to our words with that value statement on how serious we are to prove our truthfulness. You know, kids will say, look, man, I crossed my heart. Hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, right? That's, that's how we, we know, well, this kid is serious. He's going to stick a needle in his eye if he's lying. So he may be lying all the other times, but because he said this, this kid is honest. Adults, we're no different. We add, add emphasis by ramping up this so-called truthfulness with statements like, boy, I swear to God, and I accentuate that because I hate that statement. If you say it, I still love you, but I absolutely hate that statement. I swear to God. Um, It is one of my least favorite things to hear and to say. Have I said it? Yes. So I hate when I've said it and done it. But we have to, you know, ask ourselves, why do we say that? If what I say is true, then why do I have to add a value statement to a particular statement or to a particular statement? you know, sentence, you know, why do I feel the need to accentuate what I'm saying now as opposed to any other phrase that I say in my life? And, you know, we, as kids, and we hear our kids say, oh, I crossed my heart. We say, oh, that's, that's cute. You know, and then as adults, we say, well, I need to add power behind this statement because right now they need to know, I'm driving home the point, 
then I'm telling the truth. And so I, if I add God's name to it, if I swear to God, then they're going to know that this time I'm telling the truth. But, but what, what are you really teaching? What are you really saying and revealing to others? We're teaching our kids and teaching our friends and family that there's probably a little wiggle room in what we say. Because if I feel the need in this moment to swear by anything, then the other times when I didn't add that power statement, then I could have been lying. I probably was lying. And so now that I actually am telling the truth, I need to add a value statement behind it. So kids early on learn to add that power, to add, you know, I, I swear on my mama, man, that this is true. I, you know, cross my heart, hope to die. All these little things that we add really are, are this mindset of showing us, showing the world, teaching our kids that in this moment, I am serious. You know, this is when I want to reveal to you that, you know, I am completely honest, which again opens the door for, well, you didn't say it yesterday, so were you lying to me then? If you feel the need to swear by anything now, especially swear by swear to God, then where, when do I know, how do I know you're completely honest with you? You know, they again, we say, well, I swore to God, so you know I'm telling the truth. But again, it leaves the assumption that we at least bend the truth or we could be lying outright when we don't add these value statements behind our words. And what we're doing with statements like this, as innocent as we claim they are, but oh, it, I'm, I know I said I swear to God, but you know what I mean. It's, it's just a thing I say. It's just what I do. Or a kid saying, well, you know, all my other friends kept doubting me, so I had to swear by something. I swore by my mama. They know I love my mama. But again, from an early age, we blur the line between truthfulness and dishonesty. And yes, we may speak in a way that is not a lie. We say, well, I'm not lying, but I didn't swear to God. And that the reason being is because I'm withholding a little information. I'm not completely honest. We start to lawyer one another. You know, where we look for ways to get around the truth while adding emphasis through, you know, empty swears, empty statements, and, you know, value, you know, these, these power statements of, you know, I swear on this, I swear on that to, to kind of give validity that this time I'm telling you this is the truth. But again, it's nothing new. They've been doing it as, you know, us, we human beings have been doing it for years, always unwilling at times to, to face the truth because sometimes the truth does hurt. And because the tr truth hurts, we say, well, how can I give enough information to appease them but not enough to embarrass myself, to call myself out, or to stand behind my actions? You know, how do I work my way through it? Again, lawyering our way through relationships and our conversations in day-to-day -day life. And so that's why Jesus addresses this issue, to truly open up, to reveal, and describe how we should talk to and treat one another. And so he's correcting the misinterpretation of the scribes by confronting us with the truth that, you know, what we say should always be truth. It should be natural, especially, again, he's talking to disciples to followers of Christ he says if you are a disciple of mine the truth should be natural as a follower and so any swearing by anything or anyone are completely unnecessary what you say should be true and the actions and the repercussions the things that come behind your statements will prove your words to be true Without you swearing to God, to swearing to your mama, to swearing to anything. But as we've talked about in this sermon series already, we live in a world of alternative facts. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Well, just like I said in defining marriage, just because you say it's something else to fit your you know, ideology doesn't change the true definition. Just because you say your truth is, you know, subjective, is, is willing to, to bend, to, 
to alter with with you know the circumstances or with the outcomes doesn't make it true but again we live in a world where my truth is true for me your truth is true for me when we know deep down that makes no sense common sense to tell you that's so dumb but again we redefine marriage even though god defined marriage and we cannot call you know, we cannot give it a different definition you can call it something else but marriage is marriage truth is truth but again we live in this world of alternative facts and so we we find ourselves in a point where you know this idea that a man's word is his bond is really just a quaint statement oh that sounds good but that's 1930s talk you know that was my grandparents great grandparents you know where his word is his bond and he stands to it nowadays his word could be a little bit of anything you know we say oh it's cute it sounds good sounds manly but it's not realistic in today's world and again as it was is today it was in jesus day where as quaint as it is to say a man's word is his bond we know that often a man's word is nothing but empty promises or empty statements and the religious leaders were a part of this duplicity were a part of you know allowing the people to bend the truth a little bit in fact these religious leaders were assisting the people of israel in their duplicity in the hedging of truth in doing so what what they did is they developed an elaborate system of oaths to create loopholes around the truth you know, it'd make uh, a many a lawyer drool at understanding the loopholes that were created if you're a lawyer i love you it's okay not all not all lawyers you know thrive off of loopholes whereas these religious leaders did but that's why jesus deals with this verbal system of loopholes and oaths and he clears the air on the truth that should truly characterize our words as disciples of christ as believers in christ our words should be our bond our words should be truthful and any oaths to anything to anyone are unnecessary if we are simply allowing the truth to speak for itself any swears any oaths whether grand or simple are unnecessary because the truth is truth and it should be a part of who we are as believers so let's jump into this fourth antithesis matthew 5 starting in verse 33 again with this this statement that he he makes within all of these antithesis um he says again you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not swear falsely but shall perform to the lord what you have sworn but i say to you do not take an oath at all either by heaven for it is the throne of god or by the earth for it is his footstool or by jerusalem for it is the city of the great king and do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You know, again, Jesus is, is calling out the hypocrisy in regards to truth. He's turning their misaligned understanding of God's law upside down and revealing the significance and even the reasoning behind this command to not bear false witness to tell tell the truth to stand up to the words that you say but again these rabbis these scribes they would take god's law take god's word and then add their own man-made traditions man-made laws elevating it to minimally the level of god's law but in many cases elevating it above god's word adding significance to it and now preaching that as if this is the truth this is the way to live we are israelites we are god's children and this is what it looks like to be holy and righteous you know what they were doing is the rabbis and scribes they would take the words of leviticus 19 12 which says do not swear falsely by my name profaning the name of your god i am the lord and so they would take that passage and then they would create a couple loopholes that truly distinguish between speech not under oath 
and oaths made to the Lord, oaths made to God. And they would delineate and say, one, you have to stand to or you have broken this command. Others, there's, there's a little freedom. You can, you can lie a little bit as long as you lie appropriately. In fact, they taught that, you look, as ch- children of God, as Israelites, you must be honest. You keep your word to the Lord. You know, if you make a promise to God, you make a promise in God's name, then you keep that. That's what this command is telling you. But they said this same commitment doesn't necessarily apply to everyday talk, to your human relationships, whether it's your husband or wife, whether it's your kids, whether it's a friend, whether it's in a, you know, somebody you work with. There's, there's a little bit of wiggle room in the oaths made between individuals. Now, an oath made to God or using God's name now, you have to stick to that. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, everyday talk, there's always wiggle room. There's always a way to avoid the harsh reality of truth. And you're still righteous. You're still honest. You're still holy. And you're still a, a, a good child of God. You're still a, a righteous Israelite. So even with verses in the Old Testament that you know, tell us to be honest in everything, such as Zechariah um, 8, 16, and 17, it says, Speak the truth to one another, render it your, your gates of judgment that are true, and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another, and love no false oath. For all these things I hate, declares the Lord. Even with statements like this, knowing as a scribe, as a Pharisee, as a religious leader, knowing passages like this, they would still take Leviticus 19, twist the words of God, and say, look, we can play fast and loose with the truth so long as we're not breaking a promise to God. Breaking a promise to a friend, a family member, or a significant other is okay so long as you lie appropriately. You know, again... They were twisting, misinterpreting God's law, God's word. And some of these first century rabbis emphasized only the importance of speaking truth to God, therefore downplayed the importance of absolute honesty in all conversations. They felt like, yes, of course, it makes sense, right, to have, you have a special obligation to keep promises made to God, but you can rightfully, you can righteously even break promises made to others When it's convenient for you, you're still not breaking the command. You may not be fully honest and truthful, but you're still holy and righteous because you haven't broken a a promise or an oath to God. But Jesus, as with many of their misinterpretations, would have nothing to do with this logic or this elaborate system of oath-taking that was present in his day, this This mindset of finding loopholes around the truth. And as always, Jesus was crystal clear. Jesus says that disciples of Christ are to be characterized by such honesty and integrity that an oath of any sort is completely unnecessary when we think it adds credibility to our words. He says your truth should be truth no matter what. No matter what oath or promise or swear is added, all of those are unnecessary because as a follower of mine, your word should be known to be the truth because your reputation stands behind it. There is integrity in who you are. People can trust without these power statements of swearing to God or swearing to someone else that what you say is the truth. But Again, they were twisting it. They were altering God's word, saying as long as it's not to God, there's freedom to lie and to lie righteously. But Jesus says, look, let everything you say, do, and think take place with the understanding that it is all seen by a powerful, omniscient God who takes serious the words that come out of our mouths. Understanding that while we may not make an oath or swear to God in you know in this moment it is still seen by God we are still held accountable by God and so regardless of a promise and oath or covenant of any sort our words our actions 
should be truthful. But again, he's fighting these religious leaders that advocating keeping that vow only if it was public, only if it was you know seen by witnesses and used God's name. You know, but a vow made in everyday conversation referencing something lesser than God, still significant enough to add power to their words, you know, such as heaven or earth or Jerusalem or even you know, my own life. You know, you know, take my head if I'm, if I'm lying to you. All of these, they said, weren't truly binding. You know, they were okay to swear by these things. It was okay to even break these oaths because you have a loophole around the truth. They could lie, they could exaggerate in their conversations and lend themselves a, an air of credibility by saying, I swear by heaven that this is true. They could then say, I'm not held accountable because now it's convenient for me, it's better for me, for you know, my reputation, so I'm not embarrassed that because I swore by heaven, because I swore by my own life, I swore by Jerusalem or earth, or my mama, that it's okay to break this vow. One, this vow was private. So, again, when somebody calls me out for breaking an oath, I can just, again, swear by Jerusalem that I never made an oath to them in in the first place, working my way around, adding one lie and one um, broken oath on top of another and still feel as if they are righteous and holy in the eyes of God. And so what they would do is they, they would make oaths to emphasize their seriousness and truthfulness. But again, making sure that it's on something less than God, the, the heaven, Jerusalem, their own life. And the point of these lesser oaths was to allow some flexibility in breaking this so-called promise to this individual. And again, felt totally okay with it. They would say, I am righteous because... God's name had not been invoked. They, they reasoned that because I didn't swear to God, because I didn't you know, swear by the Lord Almighty, that this oath that I made to this individual in private is, is not that big a deal. It's okay to be deceitful. It's okay to break this promise or break this oath. It's okay to even lie and still say I'm holy. I've still not broken this command. I'm still okay in the eyes of God. My neighbor may be mad, but he'll get over it because he got over the lie I told him last week. You know, and it was this nonstop, you know, never-ending lie after lie, broken promise after broken promise, all while saying, I am righteous in this command to not bear false witness. As with all the other ones that we've looked at with murder, adultery, divorce, they would say, well, I'm still righteous in this command because I didn't swear by the name of God. I didn't make a promise to God. I just promised my husband or wife. And to add emphasis, I swore by heaven. And I want to leave myself some flexibility in the truth. But again, truth is truth. There's no flexibility in the truth. It is what it is regardless of how we try to you know, worm our way through with, you know, loopholes and so-called man-made, you know, flexi- flexibility that we think sets us free from these promises and these oaths. But Jesus says, as a follower of mine, as a disciple, you should just be able to simply say yes or no and mean it. If you add God's name That's just a mere technicality. It's it's to make you feel better, but it does nothing to what you're saying because what you say should be true, yes or no, and mean it when you say it because mouthing a meaningless oath does not create loopholes for yourself because your word should be your promise. Your word should be your bond, and what you say should be truthful without having to add some swear or some oath or some promise or adding anybody's name to it you know jesus says that oath or no oath simply say what you mean and stick to it if it hurts so be it learn from it if it if it embarrasses you then allow that guilt to change you the next time the situation comes up and yes i know that's hard 
because I do know the truth hurts. And sometimes we have to answer to the stupid things that we do instead of worming our way through and just saying a little bit of truth and justifying that as if we're still okay because I told enough truth, even though it wasn't the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God, I'm okay because I gave them enough to appease their response, to appease their, you know, their mind at this moment. In fact, Jesus says, all you need to say is yes or no. Your word as a follower of Christ should be good enough. Everything we sh- say should be true and good. And yes, I know that is hard because the truth sometimes does hurt. But with that, I have to add, because you may be asking, well, there's some things we swear on or swear by that I thought we had to do. You know, I have to add that when Jesus says, do not swear an oath at all, we have to see that, yes, some have interpreted this to mean that a Christian should never take an oath for any reason, such as testifying in court or making vows in a wedding ceremony. If I believe that, then the vows yesterday that I um, helped this couple for, perform in their wedding, I would have been, you know, felt guilty for making them swear by. That is not what Jesus is saying. You know, we see in court where a witness is sworn in. They raises his or her right hand and places their left on a Bible. And then they promise again, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. You know, but that's not what Jesus is saying is that, well, you can't, you can't promise or swear an oath in, in court or in a wedding or within a you know, contract that you sign your name to. You know, that's not the point. Jesus' point is, is not that you know, taking any proper oath is wrong. You know, not, he's not saying that any oath, you know, proper or not, is incorrect and is sinful for Christians. That's not the point. Well, there, rather, what he is teaching is that a meaningless oath, in order to create a loophole and retain the option of breaking it, that is what's wrong. Making yourself a way out to worm yourself through the truth and deceit and lie just enough to feel justified that is wrong just throwing God's name out there or throwing someone else's name or something else's title out is meaningless it has no validity and it is not necessary and it is wrong because if an oath is required in the course of say a civic duty you as a believer should have no problem making it if you're you know, in court, jury duty, or whatever the case may be, signing a contract, it is okay to sign these contracts to make this oath of truth in that moment. Rather, the proper application of Jesus' principle of let your yes be yes, your no be no, is that a Christian must be truthful in all circumstances. Psalms 15.4 describes a righteous person as one, it says, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. And Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 supports this biblical principle, adding to the understanding that if we are a disciple of Christ, our lives should exemplify the truth of Christ in our lives. The the promise keeper that we serve should be revealed through our ability to stand behind our words. Because what Jesus is reiterating and teaching, not just his early disciples, but for us as as a church today, is that oaths are binding, promises are binding, even when spoken frivolously or privately as part of everyday conversation. A promise is a promise. There is no loophole in God's eyes to allow a person to renege on an oath or a promise. So again... Jesus was not condemning all forms of promises, contracts, or agreements. Those are okay. Jesus was speaking of the kind of spontaneous vow made when a person says, I cross my heart, hope to die. I swear on a stack of Bibles. I swear on my mother's life, or again, my least favorite. I swear to God I'm telling the truth this time. Jesus is warning against using those types of flippant oaths as if it adds validity to our statement, adds power to our words in this moment because then it opens the door that when I don't say that then 
I could easily be lying, but because I didn't swear to God, didn't swear to my mama, didn't swear on anything else, that I have freedom to lie. I'm okay to lie in that moment. You know, so this teaching in Matthew 5 is not meant to discourage careful, thought-out promises, such as wedding vows or a legal contract. Rather, this antithesis attacks the hypocritical thinking that adding an empty oath or some grand statement of truth gives you freedom to lie or break a promise when those frivolous oaths and promises or statements are absent from the conversation. Yes, the Pharisees and scribes believed that they had a loophole in this command, as they often look for in every command that God gave us. And so they said, because I found the loophole, because I didn't invoke God's name, because I didn't make a direct promise to God, or because this promise was made in private, no one else to witness and back it up, I can actually bend the truth, I can even outright lie, and still maintain my holiness and my righteousness as a religious leader. But again, Jesus tells us that our words should be true regardless of oaths or not. And plus... He's, Jesus is reminding us that these informal vows that we make, to, that we swear by all the angels in heaven are completely unnecessary if our lives revolve around the truth. Because our words should be true without adding such frivolous statements. People, whether you add it or not, it's up to them. It's, you're no longer required. You speak the truth, and if they keep questioning you, keep saying, oh man, I know you're lying, you say, just let my reputation speak for itself. I don't have to swear to you by anything, and I definitely don't have to swear to God because that is a frivolous statement that demeans the power and name of God. And if I swear by my mom, I'm not adding anything because I have no power over myself or anyone else. And so what you say when you say should be true, and people should be able to assume because of your reputation and maybe you have to build that reputation, and that's okay. But you can build it without the addition of various oaths and frivolous power statements. Jesus says, just say yes or no. Your word should be good. There is no need to swear on this or that, and there's certainly no reason to swear to God in our conversations. We're not adding power to our reputation by swearing on anything, whether it's God family, you know, my dead relatives, whatever. None of it adds significance. The truth should speak for itself, and our words should be honest and truthful. That's what Jesus is saying is be honest, be truthful, and stand up to your promises because the God we serve is a promise keeper. So as disciples of Christ, we too should be fully trustworthy, fully honest. All the things that we add trying to you know, add significance to our words are meaningless and unnecessary. But let your yes be yes, your no be no, and understand that God sees all of our promises. No matter what statement we add to it, no matter what oath we add, God is saying, I expect you to stand behind your words. I expect you to stand up to the truth. Even though it may hurt, understanding that the truth is how we exemplify our life in Christ. Let's pray. Hey guys, it's AJ Layton, lead pastor at Access Point Church. We're so glad you guys have found us, stumbled upon us, or have been long listeners. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our page, share with your friends. We look forward to seeing you next week.